Star Wars 7x7 episode 2114. All right, this is it. We are concluding our series looking at the nature of hope as it's depicted in the Star Wars movies with the final movie in the Skywalker saga. It's The Rise of Skywalker. Punch it. Hey Rebel Rouser, I'm Alan Voivod and this is Star Wars 7x7, your daily dose of Star Wars joy and thank you so much for joining me for it. So here we are at the final episode of the Skywalker Saga, the final episode of our look at hope as it's depicted in Star Wars movies at least until... December of 2022 or January of 2023, you know, giving it a little time after the next Star Wars movie is scheduled to come out. But let's not get too far ahead of ourselves. We're here to talk about the rise of Skywalker and the way hope is described in the movie, which, you know, it's kind of funny, actually. One of the things that jumped out at me immediately was not necessarily so much hope-related as it was structure-related. It reminded me about the conversation that we had about Return of the Jedi and how hope was depicted, but we also got into the conversation of, oh, that first... 30 minutes or so of the movie played out. Back then we talked about a gentleman named Robert McKee who wrote one of the seminal books on screenplay writing called Story and has a story seminar that's very popular and you know their genre seminar now and some other things too. I actually went to his story seminar many years ago when it was at the Omega Institute in upstate New York for a week long thing with Lonnie and it was absolutely fascinating. And one of the things that he talks about in structuring screenplays, he talks about it as form, not formula, but about reversals, about reversals of fortune and how to you know, keep the audience engaged, how to keep the action flowing, how to keep a screenplay story rolling. And by reversals, it means that you want to try to reverse the fortunes of the character every so often and you know in a manner where it's believable essentially so that actually happens pretty well throughout at least the first part of the rise of skywalker you think about kylo ren he starts off in a negative place because there's a threat to his authority, right? With the Emperor's broadcast. So he is on a march to find the Emperor, and he flips from the negative to the positive when he gets a hold of Darth Vader's Wayfinder, because now he has a way to get to the Emperor. When he gets there, he finds out that the Emperor is not just the Emperor, but he's been every voice inside his head. That Snoke wasn't real, that the Vader stuff was manipulation, and so his whole worldview is trashed and realizes that he's been manipulated for years, so he goes back to the negative. But he immediately is brought back to the positive when... He says, you know, what can you do for me? What's in it for me? And the Emperor says everything and offers him the access to the Sith fleet and says he could be the Emperor of a new empire. All he has to do is kill the girl and that's it. So he goes negative, positive, negative, positive right off the bat. If you think about the Resistance, well, I could trace this all the way through Pasana, basically. The Resistance starts off negative as well. I mean, they've been beaten down since The Last Jedi, and they also heard the Emperor's broadcast, so things are negative for them. First thing we see of the Resistance is them finding out that there's a spy in the First Order and they're getting information from them. So that flips them to a positive, and then you have the negative of them being ambushed by TIE Fighters, and then you have the positive of them escaping. But then you have the negative of them finding out what was in the information that the spy sent, that it was verifying the worst possible case scenario that they have 16 hours before the galaxy is basically trashed. But in a positive note, they find out where this fleet is and Rey has an idea of how to find it. So they get to Pasana and before they can find anything, Kylo Ren finds them, which is bad. But then Lando is able to come rescue them, which is good. But then, as Lando gets them away from the initial First Order onslaught, they're trying to escape, and the First Order sees them again and chases after them. But then they beat the First Order again. But then they fall into quicksand. But then they find the dagger. But then there's this Vexus. But then Rey heals the Vexus, and they're able to escape. But the Millennium Falcon can't be used because the First Order has already presumably taken it. Thankfully, Ochi's ship actually works. 
but Ray senses Kylo Ren coming and has to go out and face him. But Ray's able to destroy his TIE fighter. But Chewie is taken captive. But Ray is able to somehow capture the ship with the Force. She is that strong in the Force. But Kylo Ren survived his crash and is now fighting with Rey, and Rey actually blows the darn thing up. And then they're able to escape, which is still, you know, a positive, because at least they didn't also get captured, but yeah, you can see that positive, negative, positive, negative, positive, negative, the whole way through. And so I did try to go you know, on a search and see if there was any evidence of Chris Terrio being a Robert McKee devotee. I know maybe J.J. Abrams is too, but I was focusing on Chris Terrio because he's the new part of this whole equation. And the only thing which is very tenuous is that Robert McKee has been a, a professor at the University of Southern California. And it turns out that Chris Terrio graduated from the University of Southern California. So I don't know whether McKee was a professor at the time that Terrio was a student, but you know, there you go. But let's talk about hope, which is the real reason we're here, okay? The Resistance was on its way to rebuilding, and this is stuff that we know from the backstory stuff, from the novels and the comics and that sort of thing, but where we find them on Agent Kloss, you know, they're still rebuilding. They don't have a fleet that can actually help them out, and Rey is still training. She is not at the place where you know she feels comfortable with what she's doing to the point where Finn is getting angry and saying, like, we need you out there, not here, and she's already feeling badly enough about how things are going based on her conversations with Leia. This is what we're learning about it, that she's in a real rock and a hard place. So there's not a heck of a lot of hope brewing for the resistance right now. And then you add on this business about the Emperor's broadcast, and then the information from the spy saying that there's this enormous fleet. It's actually legit. Yeah, so we start in a real hope deficit in this movie. But there is a glimmer of hope in the fact that. Exegol is a word Rey has encountered before inside the sacred Jedi texts, and there's a chance to actually find out where this place is so they can bring the fight to Exegol. That's where everything really gets going. And from there, structurally, in a way, the movie unfolds almost like the third act of Rogue One, in a way, because it's our heroes doing the one thing that they can do, and... The whole picture of what they have to achieve is just so enormous that it's impossible to deal with. And so they have to break it down into the discrete steps that they can follow. It's like Jyn Erso saying to the crew of Rogue One that we'll get on the ground and then we'll take the next chance and the next chance and the one after that until we succeed or the chances are all spent. Or you could also compare it structurally to Return of the Jedi as well, because our heroes go on a mission together, but ultimately the force-wielding person has to divert off onto an entirely separate mission to encounter and defeat the biggest evil of all, an evil that is also force powerful too. But because of that, hope becomes sort of a very functional thing in The Rise of Skywalker. Hope exists as long as this sort of straight line momentum is allowed to continue, right? So when there are these positive moments, like finding Lando, for example, and getting more information about what was happening on Pasana with him and Luke, finding Ochi Speeder and his body and finding the dagger, that sort of thing. As these particular, you know, mini milestones are achieved, that allows hope to continue. And yes, there are winds that buffet hope when the fortunes reverse, but ultimately, as long as they are able to continue to progress, then hope is still able to be kept alive. There is another aspect of hope that we can consider, however, and that is the hope around the resurrection of the Jedi Order, or at least, you know, some Jedi emerging in the galaxy, like Luke emerged in Return of the Jedi, like Rey is emerging here in The Rise of Skywalker, to be able to counter this overwhelming tide of evil approaching in the galaxy. And Rey is that person, although it's not really described so strongly by anyone except, of all characters, Babu Frick, who 
relays a message to the First Order defectors on Kef Beer, and Janna says, Babu Frick said you were the last hope in referring to Rey. I mean, Poe just refers to her as a fighter, and while that's not inaccurate, it kind of undersells what Rey's qualities are to the battle. Anyway, yeah, that hope is really not dealt with very much at all, and in fact, Rey as a beacon of hope is discussed more from the negative side of the house than it is from the positive side of the house. Meaning that Kylo Ren is looking at her as a source of his own hope. Although, hope actually takes on a different quality when we discuss Kylo Ren. And I am being specific about saying Kylo Ren and not Ben Solo because for the first, you know, two-thirds-ish of the movie, he is Kylo Ren for all intents and purposes. And I would say that he is not necessarily hopeful as much as he is ambitious. And there is a similarity to them. There's sort of a Venn diagram overlap as far as that goes. But I would say that ambition, at least for me personally, again, without diving into dictionary (laughs) definitions, like we were, you know, not doing yesterday when we were talking about, you know, luck or the day before with faith and trust and what have you. I would say that Ambition has a much less emotional feel, but not in the same way that luck does. I would say in a much colder way, comparatively speaking. We've talked about the notion of hope being an other-centered kind of experience, for example, that you know, as you have hope, it's you know, not necessarily for yourself, although it is for yourself, but the hopes that you have are ones that ultimately will benefit the people around you in some fashion. Ambition, by you know the opposite token, does actually, I guess, benefit some people potentially, right? So everybody in the First Order could benefit from Kylo Ren you know, being the right kind of supreme leader for the time in which they're moving. But as Kylo is being ambitious, he's really only thinking about himself and his own rise to power, his own grip and hold on power, whereas people who are operating from hope aren't necessarily thinking in so selfish a fashion. And actually, now that I think about it, they both kind of offer their own interesting blind spots, hope and ambition do. For example, when you think back to The Last Jedi and that (laughs) fun miscommunication between Rey and Kylo Ren where they have both seen the future somehow and each of them thinks that the other is going to turn, but nope, that's not quite how things actually worked out. But let's come back to the idea of hope in the rise of Skywalker. So as we talked about, you know, with the reversals of fortune in the structure of the movie, the characters' hopes are constantly in manipulation. And so ultimately it comes down to the natural tendency for our characters to be hopeful people. And this is another situation where the idea of hope versus ambition and it being other-centered versus being selfish. Our main heroes, Rey and Finn and Poe, are all hopeful about the state of the galaxy and want to see things happen for the better, whereas that is not necessarily Kylo Ren's case. I mean, I guess in a way he thinks it's better, but he's not thinking of, you know, all the people on, say, Tatooine and that they're going to have a better life under the First Order, right? This is not his driving mantra. Whereas if you asked Ray or Finn or Poe that question, they would absolutely say, yes, you know, we care. Maybe they can't do everything about every planet everywhere, but it does matter to them, whereas it definitely doesn't matter to Kylo Ren at all. But that's also part of the reason why they are our heroes in this, because they have this natural tendency toward hopefulness. And that becomes part of the crux on which this movie actually turns, because Not everybody in the galaxy is as naturally hopeful, and so it's going to take a spark to be able to get them going. The spark that lights the fire, that burns the First Order to the ground, as we talked about in the last Jedi discussion. In this particular case, it's that Lando and Chewie are going to go out and broadcast a message to let people know that the fight is at Exegol. And one of the themes that has been carried through in this movie is the notion that The First Order wins, as Zori Bliss says, when they make you think you're alone and that there really is more of us than there are of them. So that is the message that Lando and Chewie are going to carry out there, that 
they can defeat the First Order, the Final Order, this horrible <laughs> amalgam of Sith-related Empire technology, if everybody comes and joins and Poe's message to everybody in Agent Kloss is that we've got friends out there and they will come to help if they believe there's hope. So not everybody can generate this within themselves. They need other people to generate it for them from the outside before they're able to buy into it. And this is important because it leads later on to sort of a big bang hope moment that even though structurally speaking, there's a similarity between Return of the Jedi and The Rise of Skywalker, Return of the Jedi doesn't have this same kind of big bang hope moment. It does have a big bang, but that's the end of the battle for all intents and purposes, whereas it's not the end of the battle when it happens in The Rise of Skywalker. So just thinking back to Return of the Jedi, right? The battle happens on three fronts. It's happening on the surface of Endor, and then it's happening in space around Endor and the Death Star, and then it's happening on the Death Star itself with Luke and Vader and Palpatine. In a similar fashion, you have a force wielders battle with Rey and Palpatine and Ben Solo eventually showing up. You have a space battle, which is actually happening in atmosphere, but you know, a spaceship's battle, if you will. And then you have a particular mission that is necessary to be achieved, which is Finn and Janna's mission to destroy the navigational capabilities of the Star Destroyers so they can't launch out of the Exegol system. With Return of the Jedi, the battle is over when the Death Star blows up, and that's it. They don't have to defeat the fleet, they just have to blow up the Death Star. The shield bunker gets blown up, the rebels blow up the Death Star, and the fleet is just disposed of as a plot device, <laughs> and that's it. Whereas in The Rise of Skywalker, nothing actually happens until the fleet shows up and it looks like everything is at its absolute darkest moment when Poe is flying around and people are dying, Snap Wexley has died, and they're saying, what do we do? And he says, I'm sorry, I thought we had a shot. And Lando comes to the rescue at the last minute with this enormous group of people. <laughs> As they say, it's not a fleet, it's just people. And there isn't that kind of overwhelmingly magical rescue moment in Return of the Jedi. So Rise of Skywalker definitely gives you a huge punch in the Hope Department when it has the enormous fleet show up. The Soylent Green fleet, <laughs> if you will. And that right there is going to be where we end our discussion about the nature of hope in the Rise of Skywalker. That is going to... And this series of episodes, we are not done talking about hope, you and I, though. There's still a lot more to come in that regard. But for now, we're going to call it a day and call it an episode. Thank you so much for joining me for this series again and always. And may the curve be flattening for you wherever in the world you may be. This podcast is not endorsed or sponsored yet by Lucasfilm Limited, Disney, or 20th Century Fox. It is intended for entertainment and information purposes only. Star Wars, the Star Wars logo, all names and pictures of Star Wars characters, vehicles, and any other related Star Wars items are registered trademarks and or copyrights of Lucasfilm Limited or their respective trademark and copyright holders. May the force be with them. All original content is copyright 2019 by Star Wars 7x7. We hope you love it.